Hey everybody, welcome to episode 17 of the Go Get Outside podcast. This is your host, Jason Milligan. Today we are talking to Johnette Stosky. She is the executive director of AOR, that is the Association of Outdoor Recreation and Education. If you work in the outdoor industry, if you are interested in working in the outdoor industry, if you'd like to be an instructor, a guide, anything along those lines, you're going to want to pay attention to today's show. If you've never heard of AOR, it is an organization that could be particularly helpful to you. Today's guest, Johnette, is a lifelong athlete, outdoors woman. She's been a guide, an instructor. She has pretty much every certification you could need in the outdoors. I met her earlier this summer in Salt Lake City at the OR, which is the Outdoor Retailer Show. We recorded this at the Pavilions area, just outside of the huge convention center. Lots of generators around, lots of people, lots of generators. I did my best to clean up all that generator noise, so hopefully it won't be too distracting. Johnette's going to tell us all about AOR, open water swimming, her history as an instructor and a whitewater guide, and about how a rappelling accident when she was younger impacted and changed her life. Without further ado, Johnette Stosky. My name is Jeanette Stosky. I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan. I live and work in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm the executive director for the Association of Outdoor Recreation and Education. Which is shortened to AOR, correct? That's correct. A-O-R-E. You've got that correct. Yeah. So when people are looking for it, look for that. A-O-R-E. So how did you get started with, with AOR? Before I started as executive director, I was the director of outdoor adventures at the University of Michigan. And in that space, I served the students and the local community, taking them climbing, hiking, dog sledding, rafting, caving. AOR is the professional organization for college, university, military, and municipal directors, people like the work that I did. So be it from the Big Ten to a small private university, someone who has a lot of guiding skills to no skills at all, the association works to kind of advance the mission, and that's to get people outside. I decided I had been at the university for 11 years, and I had a chance to influence some change at a national level. And so I recreated myself as an executive director, and I'm trying to work um, to move things forward, advancing the outdoor profession. So give me some examples of the types of events or activities that AOR would put together. So the association, um, again, is based out of Ann Arbor, Michigan, but our membership is all across the United States and overseas. And so our member programs are taking the people out in their own communities. So everything from at Stanford um, in, in recreating in that vicinity to University of Montana. AOR itself puts on an annual conference. This year will be in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, November 18th through the 20th. And in that space, we'll be training people on their wilderness medicine, climbing wall management, diversity and inclusion programming, things that are happening in in higher education. And then we'll come together for three days to talk about issues that are facing the industry, some summits and some panels to influence change. So people can go back to their own community and apply that in their own sector. So we try to serve as kind of the best practice. So you say it's based out of Michigan. Is it a national or international organization? Does yeah. it work with other communities? That's correct. So again, that's that's just where the office is located. So like all nonprofits, you're incorporated in a certain state. We're actually incorporated in the state of Colorado, but our offices that are, are in Ann Arbor, and that's where my team and I, a team of one, serve over 700 members. But again, our members are based all around the United States or our military bases overseas. We also even have vendors from in Fiji who are providing services to the programs. Cool. So so what made you specifically want to become part of that organization? Well, outdoor experiences have been, have been incredibly powerful for me. So as a student at the University of Michigan, I, I was also an, an, an athlete there. I found the juxtaposition of trying to be a good student and be a high-level athlete. I found respite in going outdoors. It was kind of a space where it wasn't based on how great my grades were or how good my athletic performance was. I could actually just recreate and be outside, and I felt such fulfillment and satisfaction. Um, It was unlike anything I had ever done before. So I sent my summers as a raft guide up in Glacier National Park. And so here I am uh, training or working or going to school, and all of a sudden I got there, be living in a teepee, guiding people down the river, just laughing, probably smiling too much and getting sunburnt and great, you know, choco tans and just full of life. 
And then I realized that you could actually have a job and, and work in that industry. And that was very appealing. Kind of scary for my parents because they really wanted a, a 501c3 or something. Or I'm sorry, a 401 to put some money in. But I like, realized... Well, can't, can't you just try being a doctor? <laughs> exactly. Can't you just try it? You got it. You got it. So I, I found out about this type of work. And, and that work is doing things that people can't do by themselves in unique environments. Environments where there's no safety net. You take people outside and you put away the cell phone and you have to make eye contact and you have to work as a team to cross the river or to purify the water. It's not easy and that's why it's so brilliant. It doesn't have to be hard. It's just not handed to you. You have to take self-responsibility for your equipment, the people you're with. You need to have some mad skills, how to start a fire or, or again, purify that water, read a map. It's just liberating. It, it, just, it just really changed my life. And so once I had that realization, I, I looked into it and became the director of the outdoor program where I had a chance to do that uh, for a long time. So taking kids from Ann Arbor or if they were from international places to come there and t take them dog sledding. I mean, who goes dog sledding? <laughs> I would like to, but I still have not. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. I mean, th those are things that I never thought that I could do and then to provide that to, you know, 18 to 24 year olds and, and see them smile, see them build friendships. It was really powerful. And so I had that experience as the director at Michigan and then I just realized that I want to make sure that this exists across the United States. And so that's what the AOR does, is it, it helps those directors of those programs be even better, take more people outside, introduce more people to powerful experiences. So I imagine you probably see some pretty big transitions for people that come in and don't know what to expect. I'm sure the trips probably vary in length, right? Some are a day, some are multi-day. That's correct. When someone first walks in and they have no experience to the end of a trip, how big a difference do you see in that person? Or, or do you have any examples of things? That you've yeah, seen? I, think that's a, I think that's a great question. And really the trip starts when, when you choose to sign up. You know, again, that's a kind of a leap of faith. And so individuals will come together at this pre-trip meeting and you host it at the, at the center and you talk about expectations. You make a group contract. Here's how we're gonna treat people. This is, we're not gonna use technology on this trip or these are the things that you need to be comfortable. And like you said, it could be a day trip, a weekend, a week long or an expedition. You could be out for 30 days with these students and each one would have a different outcome. You know, we know that if people are out for more than three nights, it's kind of like that turning point where, where it has kind of more impact than, than the shorter ones. But in those trips, you have the extrovert and the introvert sharing a tent and, and there's that own special dynamic that happens. You see people who have working with different cultures or having different foods, right? So you have the vegetarians with the carnivores and learning how to, how to manage themselves in the backcountry and sit around that campfire. And by the end of the trip, it's just that shared experience. They've covered this much distance. They rafted this river. They climbed this, this element. They learned how to belay. But really the experiences are after they get back to campus and it's being able to reach out to someone and share those pictures or celebrate those memories and, and have, be, feel connected to someone through a unique experience they couldn't get anywhere else. It's unlike going down to the gym and playing basketball, which you know I would love to do, but that's just a very transactional. And I think those experiences where you sit across someone and live with someone just have a lasting impact. A lot of times you really have to rely on other people too and work together. And I've noticed, or at least in my experience, friendships with people who I've met doing outdoor activities, they develop a lot more quickly and you kind of bond more quickly because you're relying on each other so much. That's correct. And you have to, sometimes you're trusting other people with your life. That's correct. Yeah, I, you know, there's there's countless examples of that. You know, again, I can just speak from my, my personal experience or, or working with um, students on a, on a program from, from Isle Royal to being in Costa Rica. And it's those, opportunities where you leave that trailhead maybe you are the leader of the day you're exchanging information you're learning how to communicate you're finding ways to achieve that objective that common objective which is different than self focused right so when you're in school you're thinking about your own grades and am i going to get that job and what is it what about me and when you're on an expedition it's called expedition behavior you put other people first you realize that your needs are secondary to the group needs and so there's a sense of awareness that i think develops that is just transformational for people yeah, very powerful. And you talked about some really good examples, you know, climbing, you're on belay. So you are literally trusting your life to that person below or, or behind you or, or rafting for that example. But even just hiking and being aware of taking self-care to not slow down the group, work at an adequate pace, be prepared for the weather coming. Nature always wins and it is a great unifier. And, uh, and I mean, on so many levels to being in the tent hunkered down when the storm is blowing through and feeling the you just got the shit scared out of you to just laughing you know just realizing like what a beautiful sunrise or sunset and you're you're out there you're just away from it it's it's so incredible okay so to shake this up a little bit you mentioned 
having been a raft guide. Yes. Having gone out with a few raft guides, I know something that raft guides really like to do is tell raft guide jokes. <laughs> Do you remember any good raft guy jokes you want to share right oh, now? Oh, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> no, I would leave that to um to to Pete Reber and, and the people up at um up in in uh, in Montana. But no, I I definitely told different stories. You know, I think so. My experience guiding, I know you can't see, but I'm I'm six feet two inches, and and I you could say I have a probably a pretty intimidating athletic um, exterior when you first look at me, and 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 I grew up with all brothers in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and so the story that I would tell on the river to my clients, to the guys, to the people who would come out there is, I am living in a teepee um, away from my mom and dad and my brothers, and I'm scared, and it's exciting, and there's just so, it was just so much of a, I don't know, that's how I worked the tips, so it's not really in comedy, but, um, but so I just- So instead of used, jokes instead about of jokes, how poor you are- I, I, you used, I used the, the woe is me tactic, and often the, the, the mothers um, or the women on the trip would, would give me an extra tip and say, you know, make sure you have a good meal tonight, or you know, go and you know, maybe, maybe go stay at a hotel instead of camping. So I, I used that as my technique. <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to admit that, and I just said that I'm on the air, I suppose. All That's all right. Only eight people will, will hear this. <laughs> there you go. Or maybe uh, eighty. We'll, we'll see. I'll, yeah. I'll let you know the numbers when this goes. No, this yeah. Goes you live. think about things, but you are amazed because people, I think, have no connection. You know, Jason, the outside. But people would ask us, like, if I leave my bag here at the pudding, can I get that at the takeout? And you just realize that they literally think this is a guided experience where the river right. doesn't really go downhill, or or what elevation did the deer turn into elk? You know, and so you would always have different kind of smart comments back to the clients. You just realize that people have no idea that. Uh, that's not how that works. I think I mentioned this to you yesterday, how I was at Yosemite one time on the mist trail and I heard someone complaining that there weren't enough garbage cans. Mm -hmm. I just thought there's limited resources paying for these parks already. Do you want those resources to go to trash collection or would you rather them go to something more important? Right. And right. just maybe carry your trash back out yourself. You've got it. You've got it. Outdoors can be scary and they you're not trying to recreate what you have indoors, outdoors. And I think that we would be uh, foolish to do that. And I think that's the trash cans are a perfect example of making it nice for ourselves, but that's, it's, I don't want it to feel nice or not nice, but that's part of the process. Well, and that's kind of why it ends up being beneficial in the end is you're not just recreating the comforts of home, right? You're relying on yourself and other people That's correct. to figure out who you are mm -hmm. without the benefits. Right. Of modern society and right. technology and things like that. And just think about that. I mean, you know, again, I, I go back to this this college sector that, that my members are serving, but paddling down a river and having to work together as a team to navigate class three or class four rapids. If I can do that, what else can I do when I get back? What, how else can I contribute and have a sense of civic responsibility or connection to other things? And I think that's where people kind of look up and they need something that is is audacious as rafting or hiking or caving or climbing or dog sledding to do that. They just have to be kind of like, wow, I, I didn't know I could do that. And if I can do this, I can do anything. That, that's a good point. That gives me kind of gives me an opportunity to segue into talking about confidence a little bit, because I imagine you've probably seen some people come in lacking a lot of self-confidence who then completely changed or people who you thought, oh, I don't know if this person's gonna stick with this, who then maybe went on a leadership role or something like that. You're, you're correct in both accounts, yep. And I'm I'm thinking about a, a young gentleman, I won't see any names in case he is one of the eight people listening to this. Um, <laughs> it might be nine. Yeah, it might, might be, be nine, nine. <laughs> there we go. Uh, but Colin, I just did say his name, but he came, he was a freshman, tall uh, gentleman, uh, glasses, a very studious student, and we're riding up to this dog sleeping trip that I keep on referring to, and we're staying in this little shanty, and um, and there's a wood burning stove, and, and we're kind of all huddled around it and trying to bring him into the group, and, and just a really uh, introverted young gentleman. By the end of the night, the guy's break dancing, and it turns out that he was like in charge of the break dancing group, and, and he was like the lead musher, you know, and, and just the one who was sitting in the back of the van, just great manners and really conscientious of everyone else. But he just, he just shined at the end of the day. Did he teach you how to break? No, that's, uh, that's not, we're not going to go there. I've got other skill sets. You, you don't have any, you don't have any moves. You I've don't got, do the King Tut or uh, anything like no, that. You're putting me on the spot here. It'd be a pretty <laughs> long centipede if we have to go there. So no, but you know, and, and you also talk about the people who alpha male and females, they don't always work well in, in these settings. And I think Again, I mentioned before that the outdoors is a great equalizer, and you can be the strongest, most fit person, but if you're having an off day, if you've got a blister, it's the weakest person who's a team player who tends to be the one who, who leads, leads by example. You know, and, and again, it's not what you've achieved, it's what you do as a group that, that is just so transformative. Yeah, I guess sometimes the group maybe decides in the end who the leader is. <laughs> that is a good point. You, you see who they're looking to. That's correct. In the end. 
one of the biggest challenges I know that um, I had as a director, and I think some of my members have, is, is the trip leader training trip. And if you can imagine that setting where you have lots of leaders trying to lead leaders, um, it's, it's pretty much a train wreck, guaranteed. But that's where we talk about being an active follower and learning how to not always have to be in charge, or being in charge takes many forms. And sometimes being in charge is, is just being that person who says, yes, and how can I support you? And I think that's really big, especially in that 18 to 24 hour range of thinking, again, putting other people first, we're all going to achieve more than we could have done as an individual. Pretty cool. So if somebody wanted to get involved with AOR, what should they do? They should go to the website, so AOR.org, and find out about the different membership levels. So we have different ways to engage and to kind of contribute to the association. And that's really the starting point. And then we want to start a relationship with that person and just to see what their needs are and provide them with the resources. And then coming to the annual conference. And at that annual conference, you're going to meet a lot of really awesome people and build your network uh, beyond anything that you could ever have done before. Will, will there be hot tubs at the <laughs> annual event? There, there, there were hot tubs at Snowbird. Um, we'll be in Atlanta, Georgia this year. I, I don't know if I saw a hot tub on the tour, but we will have some other great events. And again, it's it's the education sessions, but it's the show, social events at night, and it's the laughing, and it's it's finding out that hey, your program's you know dealing with that, or hey, you know what, how are you handling this at, at your school, and um, and and having that conversation over a. A cold beverage or two. Okay, so I think we've covered a lot with the AOR, so we're going to shift focus to you now. Oh, boy. And talk about your life prior to the organization. So you mentioned having been an athlete, having been a raft guide. Mm-hmm. Did you become involved in all these activities in college, or is this something that began in your youth? Or? I don't know if you're going to want to hear this story. But oh, I want to hear it, especially when it begins that way. There we go. No, well, I, I mentioned before, I grew up with, um, with all brothers in, in, a, in an outdoor family, a father who would take us out and about and, um, and just really kind of set that love at an early age. And then I worked as a camp counselor at a YMCA camp, and that was where some really great experiences. I went off to college um, and, and played basketball at first and gave up that scholarship and transferred back. And during that time, I was having some surgery on my thyroid. And as I was lying in the hospital bed, my mom had mentioned a school of natural resources environment uh, right, right in Michigan. And I thought, that sounded pretty awesome. I didn't realize, again, that you could study these type of things. So I got involved in that program. That led to the joy of going into the outdoors and, and becoming the raft guide in Montana, where I spent some time wanting to do that work. At the same time, I was trying to train for the Olympics, and I changed sports uh, to rowing. And so I was going half my summers to Olympic training development camps, and then the other half as a raft guide. And if you can imagine that juxtaposition of being with pretty intense athletes and going for it, trying to represent the United States, to then just being a raft guide and working the tips, you know, for, and, and living in a teepee at night, it was, it was, it was pretty great. Did you ever mention to them that you were training for the Olympics when you were on the raft? Or did I did. You... Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there were some, we had some great adventures um, with that as well. A, a really great couple in Atlanta. We bought some tickets to the Atlanta Olympics and I didn't know them from anyone and they offered for me to stay on their floor if I was going to drive to them and just, just really cool backstories like that. But then I, I knew I wanted to work in this industry, and I wanted to become an out, uh, a guide. I wanted to, to go that way. So I, I set my skills on that. I became an EMT. I started to, to do some expedition work and finally made it into a, a program. It was on a pretty big expedition where I had a, a pretty bad accident. And on that accident, um, it was on day 23 of an expedition, I was rappelling, and um, I got crushed by a, a boulder. It opened up my legs um, pretty bad. The, both the, the tibia and fibia exposed the assuming effects of that accident is that I spent the night on the mountain and my team, going back to that team, made all the right decisions. And and I am here today alive with both legs um, because of the decision making. And uh, I had a helicopter evacuation and it's awesome. And I'm getting a little emotional right now. But I said to you yesterday, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me in my life uh, because that experience made me realize how powerful the outdoors are. And I realized that I now had a platform and a way to teach wellness medicine is what I do. I teach wellness medicine, I think, to kind of manage the maybe post-traumatic stress and realize that I'm lucky to be here because I want other people to make decisions and save other people's lives at the end of the day. So really, long story short, um, it's changed my life and and I am dead set at helping other people get outside and have experiences like mine. One thing I find interesting about this story too is how you refer to a horrible accident as one of the best things that have happened to you. And I feel like I've heard that from a lot of people who have had these situations. It's, of course, you don't wish it on yourself. You wouldn't run out and have it happen again. No, I don't think so. But when you get tested like that and you get put in those situations, you probably learn so much about yourself and about the people who were with you. You're right. You know, and and, and that's, that's really well worded. I think there's a sense of awareness and a sense of appreciation that you don't have when you are going about every day. And um, to have that almost taken away from you, 
um, there's an urgency. And I think people could say that I have a, an urgency for life and, a, and um, a relentless pursuit of doing things because um, it feels more precious. And I also feel like I have that chance. Again, I mean, part of the reason to leave Michigan and to become an executive director was saying, how can I influence even more people to do that? And I, I think the accident was a critical turning point for me emotionally and mentally and, and wanting to, to, to give that back. And so when you, you said you went on a few expeditions and you, you mentioned the tragic one, but I'm sure there were <laughs> others that had happier endings. What sort of expeditions were they? Yeah, so um, I had the great opportunity to go to New Zealand. It was a, it was a lifelong dream. And one of my colleagues from the association asked if I would be um, kind of an, an adjunct faculty member. And so spent uh, five weeks with his college leadership development course in New Zealand. And New Zealand is just an amazing place. And so we got a chance to explore all different elements uh, with that. At an earlier point in my life, I worked as a guide up in Alaska, guided sea kayaking in the Prince William Sound and saw the glaciers calving off and then led a couple weeks in the Talkeetna Mountains. And that landscape is, it's incredible. And, and just to work with those people and to be out in that remote environment was really, really cool. Kind of a, again, another life changing experience. And then I would say a, a third kind of expedition would be um, Costa Rica, you know, and, and going down there. I would say surfing is not one of my skill sets, um, kind of just like the break dancing. So break surfing <laughs> break is not surfing. in your future? I actually felt like I was breaking while I was surfing. Um, that's because I was a crumpled mess on the beach because I just could not do that sport. But just to go to a different country and to experience uh, the Pacari River and uh, to hear the howler monkeys at night and to see these tarantulas and shapes and sizes are a little different than Michigan was, was pretty awe-inspiring. So those would be some exotic adventures. But one thing I would share is that I, I think about my father and I think about his, I don't know, advice growing up with the outdoors. And he told me, you know, Jeanette, you don't always have to go far places to find adventure and, and just look about you. Look at Michigan, look at the places. And not, not only is he you know, an advocate for the state, but just saying, you know, I was always drawn to the mountains and, and glacier and the Tetons. And I've, I've just had enjoyed so much privilege to go to see these places. But now with two young kids, I just realized going to the local park or, you know, seeing my kids throw rocks into the river, like I can recreate that sense of adventure without having it to be outlandish. And, and I don't know if that's me just aging um, or it's just maybe some more perspective, but it's pretty cool. This episode brought to you by the Michigan Tourism Board. <laughs> Far from it. Yeah, no. But but I think that was good. One of my brothers said, you know, if you if you live in your paradise, sometimes it no longer becomes your paradise. And I don't think I realized that. You know, I was 18 living in Glacier National Park, and I really wanted to live there. But working four jobs to, to stay there would have been a, a tough stretch. So what sort of activities are you doing these days? Are you still going on expeditions? Or? Uh, I think, uh, well, actually, I will be swimming across the Straits of Mackinac in one month. Yeah, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. So that's kind of an adventure. So my, my newest pursuit has been open water swims. And I think I just realized as an athlete, I've always, I need to be a part of a, a team or something bigger or setting goals. I think that's just how I'm designed, I realized. So I've picked up swimming uh, due to a variety of other athletic injuries and surgeries. Open water swimming is pretty crazy at the end of the day. It's not a large group of us and so I'm guaranteed a ribbon most times because there's only one or three people in my age bracket which is very nice. This open water swim I saw last year. I, I swam across the Chesapeake Bay last year um, in the Bay Bridge swim and every time I drive over the Mackinac Bridge and I don't know if you've had a chance to go to Michigan yet. No I have not been to Michigan. There you go when you come back and I'll, I'll show you there but it's a beautiful it's a five mile bridge and it connects the upper and lower peninsula and those straits are just they're gorgeous and uh, Mackinac Island is right there and so every time my family and I drive over that bridge, I was thinking, I, I want to swim the stretch of water. But it's illegal because it's, there's, it's cold and there's currents and it's Coast Guard and it's a potential terrorism area because it connects the two peninsulas to, to take the bridge out. Well, I found out about the Mighty Max Swim last year. And the Mighty Max Swim is going to be on Labor Day weekend. There'll be people walking across the bridge for bridge day. And there'll be 83 other swimmers and myself swimming underneath the bridge. It's a fundraiser for Habitat for Humanity. And I just made the team about a month ago. And so I, I put my name on the list and got the phone call. And, and now I'm trying to get in shape and figure out how to swim across the straits in about five weeks. So let's discuss some stats on this. <laughs> how long, uh, what kind of current are we talking about, and how cold is this water? From what I understand, so as the crow flies, it's 4.2 miles. But you uh, will not be flying. Uh, no, I will be swimming. So 4.2 miles swim at a minimum. But uh, a gentleman that Jim Dreyer, who'll be, who's done this swim before, one time it took him up to 11 miles with the currents, just fighting against it. So I'm anticipating probably between a four and a half to six mile swim. Water temperatures can range uh, 50s to 60 degrees. So hypothermia is going to be the concern because we'll be exposed for a long time. And I re don't remember your other question. That pretty much covers it. <laughs> Distance, current, and coldness. Insanity. So, but we will be, you know, there'll be, there'll be 12 support boats. 
I'm with a team of uh, six other athletes and we'll be swimming uh, the pace of our boat. So this is just going to be um, an incredible opportunity. I think I turned 40 this year. And um, so this is kind of my way to, I don't know, it's my big audacious goal. This is my marathon. This is my uh, role modeling to my kids, setting a goal that's kind of scary. And I'm just going to work systematically to get there and and have some fun along the way too. You mentioned setting goals. Something I've learned in my life is if I want to succeed at things or if I want to feel like I'm progressing in life, I have to set goals. Uh This is not setting a goal for those listening. (laughs) One day I'd like to go to, that is not a goal. That's nice. Setting a goal means, hey, I'm going to do this by this time. That's correct. And then taking steps to do it. Yeah. I think, again, going back to, to being an athlete or, or just even in school or my parents, you know, my, my mother and, and my brothers, just if you want something, you have to you have to make a plan to get there. So you got to plan your work so you can work your plan. And that's what it's about. It's very, very strong. I don't know, I guess, value for me that, that you that you do that. So if you want something, you got to put the time in to get it. And, and that, that I mean, systematically breaking it down, putting in the work or raising the money or going to school or doing something but just saying that you're going to do it is not doing it or someday someday (laughs) that is the one you have to eradicate that from your vocabulary someday means i am never going to do this (laughs) i think you're exactly right there's probably a a quote on pinterest that says something like that. there probably is yeah yeah. so not to go back to the swim but i'm curious about one other thing because i'm completely ignorant about this sort of swimming So you will have to swim for several miles, but you're going to have a support boat with you. Does that mean that you occasionally can take rests on this boat? There's different levels of swimming and different, um, I guess, with U.S. Masters swimming, like actually competing events where you can or can't stop, or or if you touch a kayak or a support thing, then you're disqualified. This is not one of those races. So in this particular race, or I think they just call it a swim, the support boat will be there and we'll have um, supplies on board. So I'll be having things to rehydrate. So your body burns through glucose in about 90 minutes, you'd start to, you know, so um, hydration is really important in in having those resources. Uh, A lot of the races I've done, what they do is they, they throw out one of those pool buoys on a string and you just kind of swim up to it and you put your arms over it and then you can oh, feed okay. for a second. I will be doing a, a 10k swim in two weeks, uh, one called Swim to the Moon down near Ann Arbor. You swim through five lakes and uh, people just kind of hang out on their docks and they just hand you things when you swim by. It's like through through these little channels. Oh, that's, so that's, 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 that's another cool. way that people do that too. Okay. So, um, But again, I think if it, if it was actually a competitive race or I think if you swim across the, the English Channel, then there's certain rules what you can or can't touch. And is that next on the list? Not at all. No, I am. <laughs> I think uh, I think if my husband's listening right now, that's you can note that. I think there's a there's a swim in Hawaii called the Rough Water Swim. I think that would be my next one. Isn't there also don't some people or someone swim to Cuba or something? Yeah, Diane Nyad, yeah, she just yeah, yeah. just swim. And, and that you talk about goal setting and going back. That woman uh, has a. I, I think I saw the TEDx talk. Uh, about a year ago and she's she had tried that swim multiple times and had failure and when I say failure uh, it was due to jellyfish stings and to other reasons that she didn't make it but she kept at it and and so I think there was like literally a time span of two decades between the first time she made that effort and that was her that was her life goal and her whole TEDx talk is on 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 setting goals but getting after it getting it done and, and never saying never it's pretty cool. But no, I'm, I'm not doing that swim either. <laughs> <laughs> or are there also worries of sharks or something? I feel like I remember there being some big concern about sharks in, uh, details. In between Cuba and... No, I, I, I will confess, I am I am scared of the dark and I am scared of things that are in the water. So I, I actually like to worry about sharks in the freshwater. I know there's no correlation there, but, but when you're swimming, especially in inland lakes, it's pretty dark and murky. And so you know, you've got a lot of time in your head. And so you, you start to fabricate things, but... That's that's how that works. Are you anticipating Nessie <laughs> to, to swim up let's, behind you? At yeah, some point? let's hope not. Let's hope not. No, I'm 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 concerned about the sights and the waves. You know, I've not been exposed to a lot of a lot of wave swimming. So, I um, I made this analogy. I gave a presentation last year at an event and talked about the thing I like about open water swimming and in goal setting is that you can only in order to go down the course, you have to sight different buoys. And so these buoys might be 500 yards or 1,000, but you can't put buoys out for six miles. So the way it goes is that you, you look up and you set your sights on something, you direct your course, and you work towards that one goal on the way to many other ones. And I, I think that's just a great analogy for life or reaching the goals that you talked about. So if you want to change something, you have to have the vision. And the vision is something that you maybe can't see or it's the place you want to get to. And then you have to have goals along the way that will measure that success. Right. You have to look at something big and break it down into little pieces. So you got you, it. And don't, don't look at it as accomplishing the big goal, but accomplishing, yep. accomplishing From, the little pieces. Right. And Again, then before you know it, you've accomplished the goal. Yeah. Hiking mountains, rafting rivers caving you know you 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 just you go from one rapid to another you don't do them all at the same time you know and you don't get to the top of a multi-pitch climb by just doing one one pitch you gotta you gotta sit sit up systematically so 
throughout your life prior to AOR and now post AOR, have you found that you kind of just have a, a general knowledge of most all outdoor activities? Has it brought you into everything, even those you didn't know you were interested in? Well, let's not say post AOR quite yet. So um, uh, by yeah, post, there, I mean there currently AOR. <laughs> well, oh, post joining. I'm laughing, AOR. so I will hopefully have a couple other friends listen to this. But um, I would say that that I definitely am a, a Jill of all trades, but master of none. You know, and, and again, I think at a certain level, I've had the the luxury of being exposed to a lot of different mediums. Today, we've talked about different locations, you know, Alaska to Costa Rica to New Zealand, ice climbing, caving, dog sledding, but by no means am I the best or most proficient. I know my limitations and I know when I need to outsource or bring in someone who has that expertise, but you know, I'm always learning and our sports, outdoor sports are always changing too. I mean, everything from, you know, 29 inch bikes to, to, you know, fat tire bikes in the winter to stand up paddle boards or doing yoga on paddle boards. You know, those are all new things that didn't exist five, 10 years ago. So uh, to answer your question about sports, they're always changing. The traditional ones um, are still there, but I think people like myself are looking at what are the gateway activities? You know, maybe it is a, a 5k run or the Tough Mudder or an adventure race is where people will find their entry into outdoor sports. So what are, what's the gateway activity to, to get people outdoors? You don't need to hike Everest. You don't need to raft the Arkansas. You don't need to do the big stuff. There's adventure at every level. I think we've probably hit a lot of things that, that we should talk about. So if people want to get involved with AOR, they should go to AOR.org. That's correct. correct. A-O-R-E.org. Yep. And do you personally have any blog or anything online if people wanted to keep up with what you were doing? Are you posting pictures of your swim anywhere? Uh, I, 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 some of those are on Facebook, but again, swimming is not a great spectator sport, so um, <laughs> so unless you're walking that bridge. But, uh, you know, AOR.org is, is, is probably the place where people could connect, and I'd be welcome to, to um, have that conversation. And, and again, trying to get more people outside is, is the mission and vision of the work that we're doing. And Love to have people come and join me for the ride. Join me for the adventure. Thanks a bunch for coming out here and talking to me next to all these food <laughs> trucks that you can't eat. Oh, craziness. <laughs> this is great. Thank you so much for your time. All right, thanks. <laughs>
And so how do we look at the interconnectedness of things? And so she talked about looking out the window of the space station, seeing Earth, seeing our planet, and how that's now reflected in her, I don't know, artistic side. And um, again, just seeing things from a different lens allows you to stretch yourself and stretch your goals and stretch the things that you're after. So change of perspective. And it was it was empowering, very inspiring. Kind of feel like space travel is the ultimate adventure activity. It kind of takes all the best and most dangerous things about all of these outdoor things and combines them into one. Yeah. You know, my members are maybe under some scrutiny for, you know, why does why is why should we put money into an outdoor program or why should we get youth outdoors or why should we do this? It's, you know, what is the outcome? And I think because our outcome is self-efficacy and its relationship and its um, leadership skills and decision-making in real time in a space where there, like I said, there is no safety net. It's really hard for my members to quantify that. And so to hear an astronaut relate to them and say, what you do has value. It has meaning. You are changing lives. You're changing personal lives uh, through your expeditions. It was really cool. Um, Like I said, I think it just elevated my attendees, the way that maybe the lens that they look at themselves and the work that they're doing. It's kind of crazy to think that you could take a person who maybe backpacked through the snow for a week and then someone who's lived in outer space for months and there would be a common ground of some sort between them so that they could understand each other's experience to a certain degree. That's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah. And and as a little fact check here, Jason, 104 days. So she was 104 days on the International Space Station. She also, uh, she's an aquanaut. And she holds the women's world record for um, saturation diving during an 18-day mission with the NEMO 9 crew. So, again, in part of their training, she shared, you know, they live in a work environment under the sea, which was the best way to replicate maybe being out of out in space because you can't, you know, ascend to the surface of the ocean too quickly or else, you know, you get the bends or other complications. And so I think it's one of their many training modules. And she talked about that experience too. So she only likes to breathe air that is delivered, <laughs> delivered to her through some sort of apparatus. Apparently, You've got it. I think that's, I think that's her thing. It was different for us. You know, we've had great athletes before we've had artists before we've had, you know, environmental or conservation advocates before we've had people who have worked in kind of relatable industries to my membership and I think, I, like you just already kind of um, summarized, to have someone who is outside that bubble and literally expanding our horizon was, was neat. And um, I think she gave a lot of credit and a lot of respect to the membership and the work that they do, which, again, just helps us all move this thing forward. So that was the start of the conference. And then, you know, over 50, I think it's 45 to 50 great education sessions. And those would be just, you know, all the different topics, student development and climbing walls and risk management uh, diversity and inclusion topics. We had a great uh, one-day research and publication symposium. So we had some academics presenting their, um, you know, their research works, and that was kind of its own track that happened on Thursday, and I think was um, done quite well and was well received. Some poster presentations related to that, and then we had that summit series that I referred to in email. And the summit series is a new effort the association has been doing for the last couple of years about how to raise our educational deliverables for that mid-level professional. So someone who has been participating in the association, who maybe is now, I don't want to put a timestamp, but maybe in their early to mid thirties, forties, fifties, you know, they've, they've been around the block once or twice. They've run their program. They run the rental center, the climbing wall, but what's going to elevate them as a, as a professional. And then this year we did one day focused on the adventure gap. So how, how do we get more diverse populations outside and what are the challenges and how can we be better at closing that gap in our roles of authority and position? And then one day on the relevance of outdoor recreation in higher education. So again, so two different, the summit series, again, we had eight speakers or eight different sessions that came in and then one day focused on the adventure gap, one day focused on higher education. Again, we had a, a great volunteer, Amanda Even. She was um, she's been a, a, a very active AR member. Came up through the association, scholarship winner, conference host, um, servant leader, and she actually organized this year's summit series as a volunteer. And one thing she did, even which I thought was incredible, she had content weavers. So at the end of each day, she worked to unite the four sessions that happened that day and and kind of tie that theme together. So each education component wasn't disparate. So someone could have come in and listened to a gentleman from the National Park Service and hear 
his take on marketing and how to get youth outside and then listen to the executive director of the Outdoor Industry Women's Coalition and talk about barriers in that sector and then try to kind of tie those themes together so members could walk away with that global perspective. So anything coming up immediately that you want to let people know about? i um, excited just to say that there is a, uh, not not a renewed, but, but the association of the members um, from that person who came for the first time to that member, that founding member, um, is looking at our association, saying how they can engage, what can they do on their campus, on their military base, be it being mindful of who they're engaging to participate on their trips and their marketing materials, to understanding how do we get more urban youth outside, how do we also not um, project what we perceive as adventure onto other individuals and maybe do some more listening rather than talking at people. The association is doing great work in D.C. and Um, you know, with the Sierra Club and the Wilderness Society and other entities of really how do we help facilitate outdoor experiences for for youth. And now is the time for people to get involved, to be part of the association, to have their voice be heard, to seek resources, uh, to join a committee, to help support us with, you know, right now our Giving Tuesday, uh, all of those things. It's now a great time to be an outdoor educator and influence this change on a national level. AOR.org, um, you know, will be kind of the portal, and you can see our our successes, our updates. You can hear how to become a member. You can learn about Minneapolis. Next year's conference will be in um, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. Uh, the year after that will be in Roanoke, Virginia. And again, there's we're looking at member outreach and engagement, but but we really want it to be a two-way street and have people participate along that path. Oh, and one thing I forgot to ask you about, you had mentioned back when we recorded this, the rough water swim. What's, <laughs> you, what's you the like status that? of that? Oh, the status is that that's next Labor Day. Now, get this, Jason. So I did that that swim and, um, and man, that Mackinac swim was, it was a stretch. And um, I, I'm... I'm glad that it's done and um, and also looking forward to the next challenge. But the rough water swim is next Labor Day and it is in Hawaii and I'll have to decide if that's going to be realistic to go and participate. But it got canceled this year. Both that swim and the big shoulder swim in Chicago, both these big swims got canceled due to weather. And I was kind of laughing about that, that it was probably a good thing I didn't participate uh, this last go around. There'd be worse things to fly to Hawaii and have a tri- than have a swim get canceled. There would be worse places to be stuck. I'm sure you'd find something to do. <laughs> I think so. I think so. But really, I think for, for my family, for my kids and my husband, it, we'd have to decide if it's going to be a, a, a family goal. And um, I obviously want them to ideally participate and attend. And my kids could become uh, junior rangers um, at the national park there on the big island and and make an adventure out of it, but we'll have to see if that's realistic for our for our family next year. I think you can just throw some water wings on them and uh, have them join you in the race. There you go. I think they're on board. I, I don't think it'll be hard to sway them, but but I don't make these uh, decisions um, alone. So we'll have to we'll have to see if it if it if it works out. But I would like to do that very much so. So anything else you'd like to talk about that we haven't hit up on yet? I can just celebrate. You know, not only just the great conference. But again, my association is, my members are doing great work um, and I was inspired. I felt truly as an executive director that I got to see, again, that first time attendee to, you know, a mid-level professional shine. And, um, and, and that just is um, wind in my sails to, to work even harder to move AOR forward. Okay, folks, now's the time to head on over to gogetoutside.com slash podcast Take a look at episode 17, the show notes there. You'll find the usual photos of our guest in action, in this case, Johnette Stosky. You'll also find a number of links, aor.org, links to all of the swims that she mentioned, a link to a TED Talk by Diana Nyad, who we talked about earlier in the interview, Wikipedia link about the astronaut Nicole Stott she talked about in the update, And then if you were confused about the saturation diving at all, if you aren't familiar with saturation diving, well, I've also included a link to saturation diving on Wikipedia, which should make that very clear for you. So since you're going to be on the internet, you may as well send us an email, go at butcherbirdstudios.com, let us know what you think about the show, or pick up your phone, push some buttons, call 818-925-0106. You can leave us a voicemail there at our Google Voice line. Tell us anything you'd like to. Say whatever you'd like to say. Let us know your favorite Christmas carols. Or maybe sing us a Hanukkah dreidel song. In the meantime, run on over to iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, whatever you're using to listen to this show. 
Make sure you're subscribed. While you're doing that, why don't you give us a rating and a review? Rate and review the show. The only thing I want from all of you for my winter solstice celebrations is a subscription, a rating, and a review. Next week, Steve Searin, father, outdoors guy, rad photographer. And when you tune in next week and you hear about how he and I first met, you'll also learn that he's not easily embarrassed. Next week, Steve Searin. See you then.